Today we'll be looking at a little-known episode from modern history, when Israel and the Soviet Union went to war. During the height of the Cold War in the 1960s, the Soviet Union deliberately opposed US influence all over the globe. Perceiving Israel as a US ally in the Middle East, the Soviets supported Arab countries that frequently clashed with Israel. It was during one of these wars that the Soviet Union sent its own troops, planes and air defense systems to participate in a war against Israeli defense forces. In June 1967, Israel successfully launched surprise attacks against Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Syria. During the six-day war, Israeli defense forces destroyed and captured hundreds of enemy airplanes, tanks and artillery guns. By the war's end, Israel controlled the Sinai Peninsula, Gaza Strip, West Bank, Old City of Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. In the aftermath, the president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, initially announced his resignation, but backtracked after mass demonstrations in his favor. Israel agreed to a ceasefire, due to intense pressure by the USSR. Arab states used it to regain strength for a new war. By September, Arab states formulated the so-called Three No's policy, that forbade peace, recognition or negotiations with Israel. President Nasser believed only military efforts would achieve a full Israeli withdrawal from Sinai. With Israeli forces at the eastern bank of the Suez Canal, conflict resumed through limited artillery duels along the canal and small-scale commando incursions. But to push Israelis out of the Sinai, Egypt needed to rebuild its armed forces, and this is where the Soviets came in. Between 1965 and 1970, the Soviet Union provided Egypt with over $3 billion in the military aid. Egypt's tanks in 1965 were Soviet T-54s and T-55s and they had used Soviet air defense systems like the S-75 Dvina. Its air force flew old Soviet-made fighter planes such as MiG-19s, MiG-17s and Suhoi Su-7s. Additionally, the USSR sent its officers and technical experts to help train Egypt's army and air force. By 1969, just two years after the grave defeat in the Six-Day War, Egypt felt confident enough for large-scale military operations. While Israel defense forces used better equipment and tactics, the Egyptian army had more manpower and more artillery. It was seemingly more capable of waging a lengthy and costly static war against Israel. On March 8, 1969, President Nasser proclaimed the official launch of the War of Attrition. Its goal was to force the Israelis out of Sinai, using large-scale shelling, commando raids and aerial warfare. Battles mainly happened on the Egyptian-Israeli front, with a lesser eastern front that included Iraqi, Jordanian, Palestinian and Syrian forces. Initially, Egyptians inflicted considerable losses on the Israelis using heavy artillery as well as new fighter jets like the MiG-21. The Egyptians also had newly delivered Soviet surface-to-air missile systems and the P-15 mobile early warning radars. Israel used US fighters like the A-4 Skyhawk and the French Dassault Mirage III. By June 1969, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir faced growing losses. In response, she escalated Israeli attacks through the so-called asymmetrical response of disproportionately large retaliation to every enemy attack. In late July, during Operation Boxer, Israeli Air Force eliminated numerous Egyptian defensive positions along the western bank of the Suez Canal. In August, their combat jets flew around a thousand sorties against Egypt. In September, Israeli defense forces launched their sole land offensive in the war called Operation Raviv. In it, Israeli troops managed to destroy 12 enemy outposts by using previously captured Arab tanks and pretending to be Egyptian soldiers. Thanks to this tactic and newly delivered F-4 Phantom II fighter jets, by the end of 1969, the Israelis pretty much destroyed Egypt's air defense systems. This allowed them to start deep penetration raids against enemy targets in the Nile Valley and beyond. Faced with growing opposition as well as with the prospect of losing another war, Egyptian President Nasser secretly traveled to Moscow. It was January 1970, when he asked the Soviets for additional help. Nasser knew that the control of the air was crucial. 
He asked the Soviets not only to replace surface-to-air missile batteries lost to Israelis, but also to provide Egypt with more sophisticated SAM systems, like the S-125 Neva, self-propelled Shilkas and the lightweight shoulder-fired Strela II. That way, Egypt would once again have an effective air shield. Initially, the Soviets were hesitant about sending additional military aid, worried that this might trigger an armed response by the US. However, Nasser threatened to resign and warned his successor might be more pro-Western. Eventually, General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev obliged him. While Nasser wanted the Soviets to send their military aid openly to intimidate the Israelis, Brezhnev refused. Instead, the Red Army launched a covert operation codenamed Caucasus. The Soviets focused on bolstering Egypt's defenses, expressing no interest in attacking Israel and thus provoking the US. In the following months, the Soviets sent to Egypt their own regular military servicemen, experienced with Soviet equipment. They sent the 18th Special Anti-Aircraft Rocket Division. It featured 24 anti-aircraft missile batteries and 4 support batteries. Also sent was an aviation group consisting of 135th Fighter Aviation Regiment and the 35th Fighter Squadron. Between them, the two units had around 70 MiG-21 fighter jets. The Soviet Union transported most of these units by merchant ships. The ships were misleadingly listed as carrying agriculture equipment. Weapons and vehicles were hidden in cargo holes, while soldiers were forbidden from appearing on upper decks. Once they arrived in Alexandria, the ships were unloaded during the night. Troops traveled by road and rail to previously scouted positions near the Suez Canal. In January 1970, there were between 2,500 and 4,000 Soviet soldiers, officers and technicians in Egypt. By the end of June, there were at least 12,000 of them. Some estimates claim that at one point, there were over 20,000 Soviet personnel in Egypt. In the Soviet Union, soldiers loaded Antonov Ann-12 cargo planes with the dismantled MiG-21 planes during the winter. A couple of hours later, they landed in sunny Egypt, carrying not just MiG-21s, but also snow, which delighted the Egyptians. Soviet soldiers were at first quite happy about the change of climate. Despite being banned from doing so, they secretly sunbathed and ended with sunburns and sunstrokes. In the desert, fleas and bedlice were the least of the soldiers' worries, once snakes and scorpions started sneaking into their hideouts. Soldiers stationed near the River Nile suffered swarms of flies and mosquitoes. Dysentery and other tropical diseases were a constant challenge. The heat was exhausting. All the while, the Soviet government hid its involvement in the war of attrition. Its soldiers wore standard Egyptian army uniforms without any insignia. At least one political officer burned copies of the newspaper meant for the troops, lest they note official denials about the Soviet engagement in a war against Israel. Despite all this subterfuge, both the US and Israel were acutely aware of the growing Soviet forces in Egypt. However, no one wanted to reveal the exact extent of Soviet engagement in the war. Both the US and the USSR worried this might cause an escalation of the conflict and eventually an all-out nuclear war between superpowers. As long as the Soviets kept Operation Caucus hidden, they could pursue their limited objectives. The Americans could stay out of the crisis and Israel had to deal merely with a modest Soviet force instead of the entire Eastern Bloc. As for the Israelis, the mere presence of the Red Army served as a deterrent. Israeli Air Force stopped flying missions deep into Egyptian airspace, sticking close to the Suez Canal instead. During a scouting mission in April 1970, their Mirage 3 planes encountered a Soviet air patrol for the first time. Israelis immediately turned back. Israeli armed forces continued their attacks but were unwilling to start an open war with the superpower. Because of this, the Israelis scouted the positions of Soviet manned defenses and studied the patrol routes of their airplanes. Then they deliberately avoided them, focusing their attacks on Egyptian forces instead. But the clash was inevitable. On June 22, 1970, a pair of Soviet-piloted MiG-21s attacked and pursued an Israeli Skyhawk fighter into the Sinai airspace. According to the Soviet pilots, the Skyhawk went down over the Gulf of Suez. The Israelis claimed the plane was damaged, but managed to land. On June 30th, Soviet manned air defenses downed two Israeli F-4 Phantoms, 
not only demonstrating that the Phantom was vulnerable, but also showcased the deadliness of SAM systems like the S-125. A couple of days later, on July 5th, Egyptian and Soviet air defense positions withstood waves of attacks by 24 Israeli jet planes. The Egyptians and Soviets claimed downing three jets, while Israel stated it did not lose any. The Egyptian military issued rewards for every enemy aircraft downed. 300 Egyptian pounds for every A-4 Skyhawk, 400 for a Mirage 3 and 500 for an F-4 Phantom. Additionally, troops received rewards for capturing enemy pilots. This led to some confusion since Egyptian soldiers at least on one occasion mistook a downed Soviet pilot for an Israeli. Very quickly, Soviet pilots started displaying an Egyptian coat of arms on their jackets. While Egyptian and Soviet soldiers celebrated their victories, Israel's aerial supremacy was under serious threat. Avoiding Soviet units was no longer feasible. The Israeli Air Force proposed to attack the Soviets head-on, demonstrating its aerial superiority. The morning of July 30th saw Israeli F-4 planes perform ground strikes near Soviet-controlled airspace in an attempt to aggravate them. Shortly after, an easy prey was deliberately presented. Four Mirage 3s, which flew in a close formation in a high-altitude pattern made to make them seem like a recon flight of two planes. The Soviets finally sent some MiG-21s into the air. Overall, 24 MiGs took off, but not all of them at the same time, and not all participated in the battle. Some were sent to intercept the unidentified recon planes and some were sent to block possible Israeli exit routes. The Israeli plan called for the decoy Mirage to lure the Soviets into an area where four Israeli Phantoms would fly in low, below radar and beneath the MiGs and then approach them from behind. They would pick them off with their long-ranged radar-guided Sparrow missiles. Four more Mirage fighters were on station close by to aid them in a possible dogfight. But the maneuvers were wrongly timed and by the time the Phantoms got close, the Soviets were too close to the decoy Mirage. Afraid of friendly fire, the Israelis went in for a dogfight. Besides the four Sparrow missiles, each Phantom also carried four heat-seeking Sidewinders. The Soviet MiG-21s had but a small radar and typically carried two heat-seeking missiles. Back then, heat-seeking missiles were not sensitive enough to engage targets head-on, so most shots had to be taken from behind the enemy, at distances of just a few miles. Some missiles were fired by both sides right from the get-go, with one Russian Atoll missile hitting a Phantom but failing to detonate. The decoying four Mirage fighters joined in the fight, leveling the odds and very shortly thereafter scored two kills, killing one Soviet pilot. One Soviet MiG scored a hit on one of the four Mirage fighters, but even though the missile detonated almost right behind the plane's engine, the aircraft remained controllable, even though it was badly damaged. The pilot eventually managed to disengage and land the plane safely. The four additional Mirage fighters, ones that were on standby, were closing in as well, but two of those disengaged, as one suffered engine problems. Another pair of Mirage fighters was called in to replace them. The Phantoms continued their dogfight. One of the Israeli Phantom pilots got a chance to fire on a MiG. The Israeli pilot later went on to claim, I realized the Russian pilot was not experienced. He didn't know how to handle his plane in a dogfight. He proved it by attempting to flee in a steep dive, from an altitude of 15,000 feet. We simply had to follow him and have our radar lock onto him. So another MiG was downed. After several minutes of fuel-guzzling dogfight, the mix and some of the Mirage fighters were low on fuel and started to disengage. Those Israeli planes which had some fuel left pursued. By that time the additional pair of Mirage fighters were also pursuing the same mix, but were unable to quickly close in on them. They fired a short-range heat seeker, but the distance was too great. In the meantime, the Phantoms fired a longer-ranged radar-guided Sparrow missile and shot down another MiG, stealing the kill away from the Mirage fighters. Two more Mirages were on the tail of one of the remaining MiGs, that was flying away. They fired three heat-seeking missiles at it, with at least one direct hit, but the MiG kept flying. Eventually, one of the Mirages got the chance to empty its gun in the direction of the MiG, but the MiG still kept flying. It was only much later that it was discovered that the MiG did eventually suffer grave damage, and it crashed, with the pilot killed. The two different Mirage pilots were credited with a shared kill.
some of the Soviet MiGs that were scrambled got to the area too late to join the fight, so it's unclear just how many actively participated in the battle. The engagement caused bitter joy among Egyptian pilots, who were previously dismissed by the Soviets for failing to shoot down more Israeli aircraft. But the Soviets had not shown themselves to be any better. Also, the loss of three pilots shook the Soviet leadership, and their political support for the whole operation was wavering. By late July, the Soviets started moving their surface-to-air units closer to the Suez Canal and building fake defensive positions to confuse their enemies. This culminated in the last confrontation between Israeli and Soviet air forces, on August the 3rd. In a carefully planned ambush, they deliberately exposed one of their most battered S-75 SAM units near the canal. With this exposed unit, they attacked enemy reconnaissance flights on the other side of the canal. When the Israeli Air Force tried to retaliate several hours later, previously hidden SAMs opened fire. The Israelis attacked in two waves. First one featured 28 Skyhawks and Phantoms, while the second one had 20 strike planes. The second wave suffered losses. The Soviets claimed two F-4 Phantoms downed. The Israelis acknowledged one loss, but said the other Phantom was damaged and its pilot managed to land the plane, even though he lost several fingers on one of his hands due to a missile detonating close to the plane. Egyptians claimed the Israeli attack did not cause significant damage. By this time it was apparent to all sides that the war of attrition couldn't continue. The Israeli Air Force lost some of the most advanced fighter jets of that time. Golda Meir's government was aware they couldn't win a war against a superpower. On the other side, both Soviet and Egyptian air defense personnel were exhausted after months of non-stop action. In early August, Soviet Air Force Marshal Pavel Kutakov flew to Cairo and ordered termination of all Soviet flights over the Suez Canal. The USSR notified Egypt it could no longer ensure the security of Egyptian Air Force. Simultaneously, they increased diplomatic pressure on Israel. Back in December 1969, the US Secretary of State William P. Rogers proposed a framework for a potential Arab-Israeli ceasefire. After eight months, both sides finally signed the Rogers Plan on August 7, 1970. Even so, Egypt immediately sent its SAM units closer to the Suez Canal Zone. The Americans chose to overlook this as Egyptian President Nasser started opening up to the US, to avoid relying on the USSR too much. The Israelis lost between 600 and 1400 soldiers during the War of Attrition. Egypt's losses were far more substantial, losing between 2800 and 10,000 people, according to various sources. Also, at least 58 Soviet soldiers lost their lives. According to Israel, Egypt lost between 98 and 114 aircraft. The Soviets claimed Egypt lost 60 aircraft. The Israelis said they lost up to 26 aircraft, while the Soviets claimed their side downed 40 Israeli planes. They also claimed their Soviet personnel downed 8 of those. There were naval skirmishes as well. During the war, Egypt lost 6 torpedo boats, while Israel lost 1 destroyer. Ultimately, the war of attrition produced no clear winner. Both sides ended where they began. Egypt failed in its core objective of pushing the Israeli defense forces out of Sinai. However, it also managed to organize and rebuild its air defense shield, in no small part thanks to the assistance of the Red Army. In September 1970, Egyptian President Nasser died. Former Vice President Anwar al-Sadat succeeded him. Sadat continued the ceasefire, all the while preparing for a full-scale attack on the Israeli forces on the eastern bank of the Suez Canal. This culminated in the Yom Kippur War, three years later. As for the Soviet soldiers, by the end of 1970, their command started relieving them with fresh troops. While the new Egyptian President Sadat continued working with the USSR, he was dissatisfied with what he perceived as Soviet unwillingness to commit. Finally, in July 1972, Sadat ordered all remaining Soviet troops to leave Egypt within a week. Back home, Soviet airmen and soldiers received awards and commendations for their performance, but couldn't talk about their assignments. The first stories about Red Army in Egypt were revealed only decades later, after the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.